Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another debate from Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan of ABC News, and once again, it is my pleasure to serve as host and moderator as the six debaters you see sharing the stage with me here at the Skirball Center for the Performing Arts at New York University. Six debaters, three against three, will be debating this motion. California is the first failed state. Now, I want to point out that this is a debate. It's not a symposium or a seminar. It is a contest. These two teams are here to win, and you, our audience, serve as our judges. By the time the debate has concluded, you will have been asked to vote twice, once before the debate and once again after. Vote on whether you agree with the proposition, California is the first failed state, or whether you vote against it. At the end of the debate, the team that has changed the most minds will be declared our winner. So let's go to the preliminary vote. If you look to your right arm, uh, the, the right arm of your seat, there's a keypad numbered one through zero. Only pay attention to keys number one, two, and three. If you agree with the motion, California is the first failed state, press number one. If you disagree, press number two. If you are undecided, press number three. And if you make a mistake, just correct yourself and uh, the system will lock in the last key that you pressed. And I'm gathering from expressions that everybody has completed this. No one needs more time? Okay. And so to round one, opening statements by each debater in turn, seven minutes each. Our first debater speaking for the motion, California, is the first failed state Andreas Kluth, who is The Economist's West Coast correspondent. He covers politics, society, and the economy in California and the Western states. He spent a long time working out of New York, having made the move to California. Andreas, I understand in your office you work from a yoga mat. Is, is this the, is, this is not the influence of California? On not a Tommy mat in the lotus position, that's true. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Andreas Kluth. I'm willing to prove it. Thank you. California is the first failed state, and most of you probably believe that already, which is a tactical disadvantage for us on this side, but if you do, we want to keep your vote. For the rest of you, we'd like to convince you of that this evening, and before I start doing that, I just want to clear away something that might be confusing. The proposition is cheeky. As all of you know, all good Oxford-style debates start with a cheeky proposition. The reason this one is cheeky is that failed states usually refer to sovereign states, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, Haiti. And what those have in common is that they have lost a monopoly on legitimate violence, if you think that through, or maybe back to poli sci. When that happens, warlords take over, or maybe Somalian pirates, and the state as such loses authority. Well, clearly, no one on the stage tonight is going to argue in the next two hours that California is already ruled by warlords or pirates. So what are we talking about when we talk about one of the 50 states, a domestic states? We have to agree a working definition to make this interesting. California and other domestic states that may follow have failed if they fail to support their citizens and instead hinder them. What's another way of saying that is if a state, if the governance part of the state, as opposed to private industry, can no longer address or solve the problems it faces, then it has failed. California easily meets those criteria. And I just want to quickly, because that timer is running already, uh, run down some of the problems to remind you, maybe we can go into them later in depth. Prisons, California has the worst recidivism rate in the country. How did it get like that? Water, it's an infrastructure and a climate issue, but it's also a political, a governance issue. Education, before California became a failed state in the Pat Brown era of the 50s and 60s, it built the best public university system in the country. It is currently <coughs> dismantling that because it is now a failed state. Budgets, and a state is supposed to have a budget to pass it on time. California never does. That started well before the recession. California uh, states are supposed to pay their bills to their vendors and so forth. As all of you know, probably all of you know, California has been paying with IOUs. Courts. I asked Ronald uh, George, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, 
whether he thought it was a failed state, he could say you could argue that if the, cha if the state no longer administers justice because its courts are closed part of the time and uh, the dockets of cases is backlogged. California has the worst credit rating of the 50. You know that. It was just lowered again by S&P. Our opponents may try to convince you tonight that this has something to do with the Great Recession and that as soon as there's a recovery, these problems will recede. It's not true. All of you have heard Warren Buffett say, it's only when the tide goes out when you learn who's swimming naked. <laughs> California has been undressing since the 1970s. I hope to get into that. I argue that it's been stark naked since the 90s, and in, indeed, the tide has just now gone out with the Great Recession, but that's not, not something that happened overnight. The failure, that is, the nakedness, it's just been revealed. Our opponents may also argue that California has problems, but all states have problems, as Mr. Rosencrantz just reminded you here, and that that does not amount to failure. That's not true. That's not appropriate in the case of California, because only one state has all problems simultaneously. And when you have all problems simultaneously, you tie them together into a straitjacket, and that's what California is in. It's in a straitjacket because of its governance structures. I want to uh, develop that in the time that remains right now a little bit, and then hopefully uh, go deeper into it later in the evening, uh, to, to show to you what the unique aspect of that confluence is. Unique number one, three states, for example, have this supermajority uh, requirement that both houses of a legislature have two-thirds of votes to pass a budget. Three states, Arkansas, Rhode Island, and California, nothing unusual yet. Sixteen states have the same supermajority required to raise taxes. Only one state has both. How did California, California is that state, how did California get that second supermajority requirement? It was the infamous Prop 13, I understand it's famous even on this coast, 1978 when they started undressing. Um, it is part of something called direct democracy that the founders of the nation, as opposed to the state, were very skeptical and afraid of, about and afraid of. It includes initiatives, referenda, and recalls. Uh, 24 states have initiatives, uh, have direct democracy. Only one does not allow its legislature to amend initiatives that its own voters have passed, no matter how insane. Only one state, in only one state has the process really run certifiably amok, out of control, insane. In only one state do the inmates run the asylum. Tonight, uh, you may hear that California, this usually comes up, has great weather. You may hear about its beautiful redwoods. Yosemite is gorgeous. Uh, you may hear about the vibrancy of Silicon Valley, which I used to cover. All of that is true, it's all irrelevant. Because we're not talking about whether or not the state has assets, whether or not there are some good things in the state. Of course there are. We're talking about whether the state as such, the structures that make the state, the governance structures have failed, and indeed they have. And the other states must be very careful uh, unless they, they have the same, unique, the same combination of problems that put them in the same straitjacket and also lead to failure. Our opponents are great orators. Don't let them confuse you tonight. <laughs> I'll be back in, little, in a few minutes. But for now, just remember that what the definition of a domestic failed state is. Remember to stay on our side. Stay on our side. You probably are there already. California is the first failed state. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas Cruz. Our motion is California is the first failed state. You've heard the first opening statement in support of the motion. Now to speak first against the motion, I'd like to introduce Gray Davis, the 37th governor of California, who happens to be, like me, Bronx-born. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, a lot of hands, a lot of hands. Um, <coughs> governor, you can start heading for, the, uh, for, the, for your lectern. Um, governor Davis uh, uh, encountered direct democracy head on head when he lost a recall election in 2003, but prior to that he had won almost every election he had ever run in as he served as state controller uh, and as lieutenant governor. He is, though Bronx-born, a true Californian. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank Gray you. Davis. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. I'm thrilled to be back in New York. As John said, I was born here. Many of my relatives are here, actually most of my relatives. I graduated from Columbia Law School, and not to be outdone, NYU sent me two graduate students to help me get reelected in 2002. So I'm fond of New York. I think I have a sense of how New Yorkers think, and I think a lot of you probably voted that California is the first failed state. So my hope is that I can impress you with what is right about California and why it's already an asset to the nation and will be more of an asset as we move forward in this global society. Um, first, let me acknowledge that there are problems in Sacramento, but the shortcomings of our elected officials should not detract from the creative contributions of our 37 million citizens. Our GDP, which is one way we measure societies in this world, is 1.9 trillion, far and away the largest in America, larger than Russia, larger than India, larger than Canada, in fact, the eighth largest in the world. And if we were a separate country, we would be a member of the G8. So one way we measure societies in a capitalistic world is by their GDP, and certainly California has no apologies for that. I'm also pleased to see that a recent edition of Time magazine uh, agreed and was very bullish on California. Uh, it titled its piece, um, uh, California is still the American dream, and I quote, it, is, uh, it, meaning California, is the cutting edge of America's future. It is the greenest, most diverse, most global, and most Asian-oriented society at a time when the world is moving in all those directions. It is an unparalleled engine of innovation, a mecca of high-tech, biotech, and now clean tech. In fact, from 2006, and I'm still quoting, 2006 to 2008, it received 60% of all the clean tech investments in this country. And in 2008, it received more venture capital funds than the other 49 states combined. With all of its problems, it still managed to nurture some of the most innovative companies in the world, Google, Apple, Hewlett Packard, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Cisco, Intel, Disney, eBay, and many other companies that are helping invent the future for California and for, the, for America. California is all about change. It likes to get there first, and it frequently does. It was the first state to regulate greenhouse gases. It was the first to allow full-scale stem cell research. It was the first to establish renewable energy portfolio standards. What do I mean by that? It said to its utilities, use renewable energy, depend less on fossil fuel. As governor, I was proud to sign all those uh, bills into law, but prouder still to be part of a 35-year tradition of promoting energy efficiency and energy conservation. Now, why am I talking about this? Because gr the green economy is the next great wave uh, in the American economy. We have to be green. We have to be uh, reorienting the grid. We have to live more lightly on the planet if we are going to compete uh, globally. 35 years ago, during the first energy crisis, California decided if it wanted to promote conservation, it has to give the utilities a financial incentive to permit that. So it said to the utilities, you can make more money if you encourage your customers to consume less. And ever since then, we've been regulating everything that uses electricity, from appliances, refrigerators, uh, dishwashers, homes, all kinds of businesses, cars, uh, and even lately, flat screen TVs. And along the way, we saved ratepayers $56 billion and avoided building 24 new power plants. In fact, our electricity growth has been not a zippo, zero, over 30 years as we came, became the largest state in America. The rest of the country is more than 50%. Why do I tell you that? Because how America obtains, obtains energy in the future will be critical to our economy, our environment, and to national security. And I submit to you that California's proven leadership in this area over the last 35 years will stand this nation in very good stead. Now, to be sure, we have problems in Sacramento, but believe me, the voters have tuned into this issue, and they have already made change that's substantial. For many years, the legislators 
drew their own districts, meaning, meaning they decided in what district they would run. They decided you would be in my district, you would not. And so surprising, not surprisingly, they almost never lose. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger proposed a redistricting plan. It passed. I supported it because I believe it's time the voters draw the lines, not the people. And it's time we bring accountability to Sacramento. That will kick in in 2012, and that will make a big difference. Now voters get punished uh, if, they, if they react harshly towards their core constituencies. Republican raise taxes. They have all kinds of recall attempts against them. Democrats punish the teachers. There's a primary opponent next time. Under a redistricting plan, if you don't solve the problem, you will get defeated. Similarly, in June, there is an open primary. A change I predict California will embrace. I support it. I'm the only governor elected in an open primary. The Supreme Court of the United States struck it down, but they have approved this version. It's essentially a municipal election. If uh, anyone can vote, independents, Republicans, and Democrats, and you can vote for a Republican for governor or a Green Party for governor or a Democrat for governor, the top two vote getters run off in the general election, even if they're from the same party. That's going to produce pragmatic, moderate, problem solving candidates. Finally, there's a call for a constitutional convention. I support that idea. It's time we eliminated, in my judgment, the two-third vote requirement to pass a budget. Yes, we have a two-third vote requirement to pass a budget and a separate one to pass the budget. Just that requirement to get two-thirds vote to pass the budget is the reason we are always late. It's ridiculous. Only three of the states have it. I think that's the kind of thing a constitutional convention will change. And if the changes are, are sensible, the voters will accept them. So in short, uh, our private sector uh, is the envy of the world, and innovation will lead America uh, into a future that is brighter and stronger. Our public sector is on the mend and will get better uh, at the end of 2010. Vote no. Number two, vote no. <laughs> Thank you, Jay Davis. Our motion is California is the first failed state, and up now to argue for this motion, to argue that California is the first failed state, I'd like to introduce Sharon Waxman, who has a long and distinguished career working for the New York Times and the Washington Post, both as a foreign correspondent and as a correspondent reporter covering the entertainment industry from the inside out. She's written books about it. She has um, started a, 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 a web uh, portal on the entertainment industry known as theraft.com, and Though you are arguing that California is a failed state, you believe enough to base your business there. Am I right about that? Yeah, I like the weather. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. Ladies and gentlemen, Sharon Waxman. So before I get going, I just want to know if Gray Davis's relatives are going to get to vote this evening, <laughs> if they're filling half the room. Um, I come to you tonight as, as a mother, as an engaged citizen, and as a journalist who has covered California for the past 15 years. So let's start with the area I know best that I deal with every day, and that's Hollywood. Hollywood, the symbol, a signature of California. Uh, part of the dream of what California represents, and a symbol, of course, to the world of California's industry, creativity, prosperity, and the values of American culture. Here's the only problem with that. Hollywood's not really in Hollywood anymore. It's gone to New Mexico and Arizona and New York and Vancouver and London. So Avatar, the movie that is now breaking all the box office records, was really filmed in New Zealand. And Twilight, that series that all your kids, uh, uh, all your daughters are going to see, was filmed in Vancouver. And Harry Potter, that series of extremely successful movies, was filmed in London. So there is uh, the, the people who run the industry, which is a, a fairly small number of people, they still live uh, in Brentwood and Bel Air and Beverly Hills and places like that, but the hundreds and thousands of jobs that produce this uh, juggernaut of, uh, of jo not just of jobs but of tax revenues to the state has largely fled. Film production is down to half of what it was in California in 1996. This is the way, this is the way things are going. And the reason for me it has a lot to do with California failing to create a sense of connectedness with this in incredibly core industry. It's so much of what 
we're, we ought to be proud of it. By the way, of course, the entertainment industry is one of America, America's top exports, not, not only California. But it doesn't feel like that there is a connection between, uh, uh, between what the state uh, represents and what the identification that we have with Hollywood and that vast entertainment industry with the state. And why is that? Uh, it seems to me that the state has neglected it in, in, and as it has neglected so many things. And that goes to me to sort of one of the one of my uh, big uh, observations about living in California, especially after having lived around the world for for much of for for the beginning of my adult life, which is that there isn't that sense of connectedness as a community, and the state plays a big role in that. Where we live in California uh, is largely in gated communities with private security. We live in isolation. This is no, this is nothing new. We all know that. Uh, people, uh, you can go to a place like Koreatown, which has the largest ethnic community of Koreans outside of Korea, 800,000 people. That community feels extremely Korean. They feel extremely connected to the country of their parents' birth, or of their birth, or of their ancestors. I don't think they feel Californian. And I think that that's true of so many of the ethnic groups that have come to live in enclaves in California. I see that as a failure of the state to create that sense of identity among them. Here's another big thing that bothers me. Uh, people who know me know this is my pet peeve. The state has not provided an infrastructure that allows us to be a community. And community is all about what the state is there to protect and preserve and to nourish. So I can't tell you how many times I have driven up to the edge of the 10 freeway from where I live in Santa Monica, peered over the railing, and hoping to go to a Lakers game, or to visit a museum, or to go visit Disney Hall for the first time, which I would have never succeeded in doing when they were actually playing a concert, and dared to jump into that essential parking lot of the 10 freeway. That's because there isn't a transportation system that works. We are essentially a city that sits on the roads and that we have, of course, made a decision not to have a public transportation system of any significance. And the roads are long neglected and the state has not invested in them. To me, that is, uh, as a member of, uh, of somebody who wants to participate in the community, I feel I can't get to the community and that, to me, is a failure of the state. Finally, I want to speak to you as a mother. I'm the mother of three children, and I moved my family from Europe, actually, to raise them in California. And we all, all of us in our family, my husband and I, and kids were then small, were aware of what it meant to, to go pursue the California dream. That dream has really turned out to be one that we have to create for ourselves. We, uh, we came from Europe where public transport was something that was a given. Medical care was a given. Education was a given. At the very least, I knew that coming to California, that I was moving to a state that had the best public university system in the country, if not the world. Today, that system has been, I feel, taken away from us. The, because uh, of the problems with the state, they've just again, you've probably all read about it, raised the fees some 30% in the UC system. And they're now approaching the fees of a private university. It now costs about the same to go to UCLA Law School, my son, the lawyer, I'm just still hoping, and, and as it is to go to a private law school. How is it that the state is abdicating its role in creating a generation of the best and the brightest in the state of California, which was all about what California represented? So, all of this together leads me to say to you that California is a failed state. I commend the governor on all of the changes that he's laying out as hoping to come to California. And as an entrepreneur, having started the RAP.com, I can tell you that there are wonderful companies there, and, there, and I chose to start my company in California. However, that doesn't mean that that is because the state encourages us to do so or allows us to do so. That is a testament to the innovation uh, that, that uh, the, the, the citizens and the residents of California uh, have shown. It is not proof that the state has not failed. And so I, I would like you to vote for the proposition that California is the first failed state. It has <coughs> neglected its fundamental industries, it has neglected its fundamental functions, and it has neglected its fundamental values as a state. Thank you, Sharon Waxman. Thank you, Sharon Waxman.
Okay, a reminder of where we are. We are halfway through the opening round of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan of ABC News. We are listening to opening statements from each side. We have six debaters, two teams of three, and they are fighting it out over this motion. California is the first failed state. Now on to our next speaker against the motion. I'd like to introduce Van Jones. Van Jones was the founder, co-founder of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Green for All. He was part of the Obama administration as special advisor for green jobs. He resigned that position after being targeted in a nasty political imbroglio, but his standing in the greenest state in the nation is enormously high in the green movement. And, and Van, I saw on Facebook only today a, a draft Van Jones for governor page. Would, <laughs> would you want the job? Well, I, it, it would be an honor to serve, and I'll tell you this. One, I, I'm not running, but <laughs> being honored to serve, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, California is not a failed state, and our, our colleagues have pretty much conceded that they cannot win this argument based on the assertion that it's a failed state. So instead, they point to some failings. Uh, but what they haven't told you is that every single one of the problems, structural and otherwise, that have been pointed to uh, have solutions, and the solutions are now on the way. We have in our state, uh, we are the biggest state, we have some of the biggest problems. We also have the biggest potential for problem solving and the largest number of problem solvers. So every one of the structural problems that's been pointed out from redistricting uh, to the tax issues, to the budget issues, have uh, gathered the uh, combined wisdom across the political spectrum. There are now ballot measures moving forward. Uh, there are solutions for these problems. To say that California is a failed state is different than saying it has some failings. We have some serious failings, but we also have uh, a, a set of, 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 of assets uh, that our friend was trying to make sure you didn't, didn't pay attention to that will help us solve these problems. First of all, when you look at a state like California, you look at a state that on the three critical issues that are most important for our country, California is not failing. It is succeeding and it is leading. What are the three critical issues? Number one, how will we power America, as the governor just talked about? How will we power this country? Will we continue to rely on the uh, post-whale oil strategy that we've been stuck in with petroleum and coal uh, for 100, 150 years now? That's a post-whale oil strategy. We'll continue with that. Or will, will we innovate our way out? Will we invent and invest our way out? In California, that is what we are doing. In a failed state, capital does not flow in. Capital flows out. In California, we have quadrupled in the past two years the amount of venture capital flowing into the state because we are trying to solve the biggest problem humanity faces, the problem of global warming, and the biggest problem our country faces, the problem of energy independence. California is leading and succeeding in that. We just attracted a company, uh, uh, Electric Vehicles uh, International, to come and build zero emission cars in California. They could have gone anywhere in the world. They came to California because of the policy certainty because of the consumer demand, because we're on, on, the, on the front edge. We have policies in place, passed, despite all the problems with our legislature. We have passed on a bipartisan basis with a, a Republican governor, a Democratic uh, a legisla a legislature, uh, AB 32, our Global Warming Solution Act, which will drive the creation of 400,000 clean and green jobs. We have set high aspirations with regard to renewable energy, uh, possibly uh, as many as three quarters of a million jobs uh, that will be created there, 15,000 jobs right now in, solar, in the solar industry and growing. A failed state doesn't do that. That's not a failed state. Uh, number two, uh, yes, Sacramento has a ton of problems. Help is on the way. Great ideas are on the way. But the entire state of California does not live in Sacramento. We have an incredible level of innovation at the governance level cities and regionally across the state. Because the second big problem is, how are we going to live together in cities? How are we going to live together at a community level? Can we solve problems? You see in California problems being solved every day, tough problems. Look at the problems with the port of Los Angeles, just to brag a little bit on the people of California, where uh, the pollution was so bad that little kids who live close to the port of Los Angeles were getting asthma and dying. And people said, we can't solve this problem because of the, the, the log jams and all the special interests. They got together, they sat down, they came up with a clean truck program that helped lift the, the living standards of 10,000 truckers, got new uh, technology in those trucks on the roads, and took asthma inhalers out of little girls' and little boys' pockets. 
Uh, that is the kind of problem solving that's going on at the local level. In Fresno, you have a wonderful new mayor, uh, Ashley Swearingen, who has been able to pull people together in the in agricultural heartland of our state and create 19,000 new jobs uh, through a regional uh, uh, economic initiative. Uh, in, the, in Northern California, you have mayors like Gavin Newsom, uh, Ron Delms, and others who've come together, who've come up with locally, uh, local creative financing to get green home improvements going, weatherization and solar panels attached to property taxes so people can actually get all these new technologies going. These are the kinds of things that are happening on a daily basis. And those things don't happen in a failed state. In a failed state, when things are tough, people turn on each other. In California, people are turning to each other and working together across lines of class and color. And the last thing I want to say is that the, the third big challenge for this country and for this world is, how are we going to live together? In the age of this kind of diversity, how are we going to live together? There is a miracle every single day in California, a miracle. If, and it's a miracle of cooperation. There are, in Oakland, California, there are 30 to 40 different languages spoken in the public schools. 30 to 40 different languages spoken in the public schools. To the extent that there is conflict, it's not about that. It's not about that. We've been able to figure out a way to come together, to work together. That is not just a good example for the United States. That's a good example for the world. There is no place in the world that has the kind of diversity and density that we have that manages to do it with elegance, that manages to do it successfully. And when you have a state uh, that 20 years ago, there was a conflagration over race and ethnicity. People remember Los Angeles tw almost 20 years ago. Somebody stood up and said, can't we all get along? Can't we all get along? Californians have answered that question. Yes, we can. Yes, we can get along. And we do it every day. And it's out of that uh, uh, community of many colors, uh, many classes, with every, every faith, every sexuality, working together on a daily basis, that great solutions have come in our economy, have come in local governance, and are now coming for our state governance. This is not a failed state. We have some failings. But this state is a state that is now rallying to solve those problems. Don't vote against us. Vote for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Van Jones. Our motion is California is the first failed state. And now to argue for that motion, to argue that California is the first failed state, I'd like to introduce Bobby Shriver, who is a councilman in Santa Monica and co-founder of One.org and a scion of one of America's greatest political families. Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby Shriver. Thank you very much. <laughs> I also want to put in a plug for RED, which I uh, started also with my great colleague Bono, my partner, which I always like saying, because most of my life people have been saying other things about me. I was President Kennedy's nephew, and my dad started the Peace Corps. I was Sergeant Shriver's son. My mom started the Special Olympics. I was Eunice Shriver's son. And then a terrible thing happened in our family. My sister went on national television and became the host of the CBS Morning News. So four brothers, very competitive Irish family, were faced with the prospect that we were going to be known forever as Maria Shriver's brothers. <laughs> so we had a meeting. What can we do about it? We had various ideas, none of them very good. At one point, one of my brothers said, well, face it. You know, it's done. It can't get any worse. And then Maria got married. <laughs> <clears throat> So uh, I love it when I go and see in the program that I'm Bono's partner because I'm really tired of being Arnold Schwarzenegger's brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, appreciated uh, our eloquence of some of our colleagues, but I want to point out very, very specifically that all the answers are on the way. They're not here now. And I can tell you in local government, where I serve on the city council in Santa Monica, things are bad. We're lucky in Santa Monica because we have a great diverse tax base. But just to give you a couple of illustrations, our redevelopment agency had a budget this year of $30 million. The state took $22 million of that. How can you work on that basis? And this is a reminder also that when you talk about the state, you're not talking about Google and Intel. And you're not talking about local government. You're talking about the state government. It's very important. The state is a constitutional entity. It's a legal entity. It's not California. When Steve Jobs writes on every Apple product, 
designed in California, assembled in China. He's not talking about designed in the state house of California. He's talking about in the culture of California, which I think we all agree is the greatest culture uh, in America, maybe in the world. Thank you for the local Californians on the culture. Think about it. Right now, good, interesting point. Segway, I'll go to your idea. There's no art education in the state in the public schools. We're the last in the state, in all of the 50 states. We're below Guam in arts education. It's serious. I mean, it's, it's kind of a little funny, but it's, it's hard to believe, really. And that's a state responsibility. The money's not there. Why is the money not there? Because the people have lost confidence in the government. Obviously, I'll give you another example. In Los Angeles, you have the biggest homeless population in America, 80,000 plus people. The LA County Jail is the largest mental health facility in the world, in the world. If you go there, every single one of you, I don't care what your background or point of view on this debate would be, would be sickened to see what's going on in there. There's a famous quote from the, uh, I think it was Hammurabi, who said, the pur one of the purposes of government is to protect the weak from the strong. We have completely failed. You go in that LA County Jail, you will see the weakest people in our society, mentally ill people living in cages. They have 14 full-time pharmacists to medicate them in downtown LA. Of the 85 or some odd thousand people who are homeless, about a third are veterans. We have a 400-acre property in West LA and Westwood that have empty buildings in it, which were built as mental institutions for veterans that are empty and have been empty for more than 20 years. Why is that? The state hasn't cooperated with the feds to fix that. I don't, I don't know. I can't come here and give you an answer. I've been trying to fix it for the last five years, and so far I've failed. Although President Bush and Secretary Nicholson did designate three of the buildings for homeless veterans, which is a positive thing. And I understand that uh, uh, one of the answers on the way there is $50 million into the new defense appropriations bill for that building, which would be a great thing. But the fact that people burned, in my little, little Santa Monica, a man burned to death in a dumpster, homeless man burned to death in a dumpster uh, several months ago, is unacceptable. And you can say, well, that, as a senior official of uh, the state said to me, well, Bobby, you know, you've got to calm down. You know, you got to, you're very hopped up about this homeless thing. And I said to him, he said, why are you so hopped up about it? I said, I'm afraid my mom, God bless her and God rest her soul, is going to hear that a homeless guy burned to death in the dumpster in my jurisdiction, which is what she used to call it, my jurisdiction, not my constituency. Because uh, <laughs> she would be enraged. So going on to the kinds of things that Sharon said, the public community, which is really an, an, a, the primary goal of the state, not to get too esoteric about it, but to have a kind of political compassion for people does not exist. You can't have that many homeless people. You can't have the underfunding of education that exists. You can't have that many homeless veterans and say that the state has been successful in creating amongst its citizens a concept of political compassion, that we're going to get together. We have community interests. We're going to get together, and we're going to do something about them. And ideas are on the way, and green tech, great. It's, it's all fantastic. For the least of these, it's not fantastic in California. It's really not. I'll give you another example, local example. City of Beverly Hills has a school system. Santa Monica has one. The state is organized in school districts like that. They had kids from out of the city of Beverly Hills in that district because the state used to pay, and still uh, may, a certain amount per student. So you would bring people from out of your district who were not there and educate them. They changed that formula recently. What did Beverly Hills do? And they're not bad people. They expelled all those kids. Why? We're not getting paid for it anymore. That's a state failure, not a Beverly Hills failure, not a failure of those communities. So as you think about how you're going to vote, it's very important to say, and, and I like to be optimistic, and I am optimistic. When they asked me which side of this debate I want to be on, I said I wanted to be on this one. They said, well, don't you want to be on the optimistic side? I said, this is the optimistic side. <laughs> this is the optimistic side. Because if you don't know that the problem is as bad as it is, if you don't go to the LA County Jail and see that, you think and I mean this respectfully, that help is on the way. Help is not on the way. We, we this year, I'll give you one final example. The CalPERS, the pension charge to, little, to cities, going up 25%. 
in our budget. That's a breaker. You know, so it, it, it has nothing to do, as I said, I'm repeating myself, with Google. It has to do with can you run the trains on time. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby Charter. California is the first failed state in our is a, California is the first failed state is our motion, and you have all, heard all of the debaters but one. Next up to argue against this motion, Lawrence O'Donnell, who has one of these uh, Renaissance man res resumes, having held positions as a uh, political analyst for MSNBC and having served as uh, <laughs> chief of staff for the U.S. Senate Finance Committee and for being a writer and producer on West Wing and for being an actor on Big Love as well. It's a lot. Thanks for coming by. <laughs> Do I um, answer Donna. Thank you. Do I really have seven minutes? Be because, you know, on MSNBC, I never get out more than a sentence and a half before Pat Buchanan interrupts me. So <laughs> I don't know that I have seven minutes. Um, I'm, uh, I had some prepared material, which I, will, which I will use some of, but I would like to very quickly go through some of the points that you've heard uh, from the, the presenters of this preposterous idea. I want to, though, give you the correct concept that you're aiming for here in the, in the title of this proposition. Is it the first, the first failed state? What that means is, is it the worst of 50 states? All this side has to do, all it has to do, is give you the idea that there might be somewhere <laughs> in the 50 states, somewhere, one, one, that's doing something worse than California, or maybe doing everything worse than California, and oh, by the way, might also be a slightly less desirable place to live. That's our chore. We have to find you one that you don't want to live in. Um, you know, the proposition was defined uh, by, by Andreas at the beginning. He had to admit that it was a cheeky proposition, uh, the, backing off from, from the, the strength of the declaration in the proposition. Uh, he mentioned recidivism rates in California prisons. They're not good. Crime is down. Does that count? Does it matter that Los Angeles crime is down dramatically because the mayor had the wisdom to import the police commissioner that Rudy Giuliani's ego couldn't stand in this city, Bill Bratton. <laughs> Bill Bratton came out to LA and, the pro and, and, and through an exercise of government, local government, local police work, got that crime rate down dramatically, as he did here. Uh, the, uh, you'll hear about different problems. You'll hear Bobby talking about the homeless. That's, that's important, that is, that is tragic. But remember what the case is here. The case is, is, is it somehow a California issue? Is what Bobby talked about a California issue? California has more homeless people than any other state. It has more wealth than any other state. It has more poverty than any other state. It has more agricultural production than any other state. It has more people. It has more. Every single thing they will tell you about, anecdotally, yes, California has the most of it. But as we sit here in the lower end of Manhattan, is it conceivable? Is it conceivable that a homeless person has died in gruesome circumstances in this zip code? Ever? Or maybe how often? Is that the question for this zip code? Um, you know, Sharon mentions getting around is difficult. The traffic's hard. It is hard. It's hard to get your car to a Dodgers game from Santa Monica where Sharon and I live. That is true. What time do you have to leave to get a 7 p.m. flight from JFK? <laughs> from here. Not from up on the Upper West Side where it's even more difficult. But what time? When would you leave? Three? <laughs> I mean, you know, factor in some security issues at the airport. Uh, I don't take 7 p.m. flights from JFK because I can't get there. It's just not going to work. I'm going to have to surrender too much of the day. Uh, the, the budget cuts in the university system, budget cuts, educational budget cuts have been mentioned. Take your time. 
take all the time you need to come up with the name of a better public university, not in the 50 states, in the world, a better public university than the University of California at Berkeley. Take your time. We have all night. <laughs> the, um, the delicious irony, the delicious irony of having this debate in this state. Today's local paper, the New York Times, in its seemingly endless editorial series called The Failed State. <laughs> it stars, as usual, Albany. <laughs> They've, uh, this one happens to, be, happens to be about the ethics bill, that they're, the, the, the improvement in the ethics uh, uh, programs that they're trying to introduce in Albany, utterly hopeless. You'd think there'd be some momentum for that after Joe Bruno gets convicted uh, in, of actually running businesses out of his office and other sorts of illegalities. There'd be some momentum for it, but there's, it's, it's hopeless. It won't happen. You don't know what the outside income is of your state legislators, and you don't know it by law. So when you want to have this debate about failed states and failed state governments with the state legislature that you have. Having it here is cheeky. <laughs> I lived here longer than I've lived in Los Angeles. I worked in government with Senator Moynihan, uh, very much concerned with issues facing this state, very much concerned with its fair share, for example. The, and the, one, what we discovered and what we harped on endlessly uh, back in the 80s and 90s was New York sends more money to the federal government than it gets back, hence all of its budget problems. Well, the problem is much worse in California. California gets 79 cents back for every dollar that it sends to the federal government. So the reason you don't have 40 other so-called failed states is because California tax money is paying for Alabama. It's paying to keep Alaska running. It's paying to keep Arkansas afloat. You can't balance any of the books in those states without the money that comes out of California pockets to fund it. There's much more to be said about this. Uh, I'm running out of time to do it. I, I, I didn't think I had six minutes. Uh, seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence O'Donnell. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Square debate. This is a debate from Intelligence Squared U.S. I'm John Donvan of ABC News, serving as moderator, and our motion is California is the first failed state. We asked you in the audience who will be serving as our ultimate judges when the debate, before the debate began, to tell us where you stood on this issue. We had you all vote. I now have the first results of that vote, and we do have a contest. Before the debate on the motion, California is the first failed state, 31% of you were for the motion, 25% against, and 44% are undecided. So it's really wide open. Now moving on to round two. And in round two, the debaters address each other directly and they also take questions from myself and from you in the audience. When I come to you in the audience, which will be in a few minutes, uh, if you raise your hand, I will um, find you. And uh, we'd like you to rise. If you're a member of the news media, we'd appreciate it if you would identify yourself as such. And when you take the microphone, hold it about a fist's amount away from where you're speaking uh, so that the NPR stations can hear you clearly, as well as Bloomberg. And I really want to urge you to keep the questions to 30 seconds and really to make them questions. So don't argue with the panel. Questions with question mark at the end of it. <laughs> round one, our middle round. And I begin with a question to the team that is arguing that California is the first failed state. You have been making an argument primarily, not entirely, but primarily that the failure of the state of California is largely a political failure, the failure of the political system leading to gridlock and as a result, lack of services. The other team 
is arguing about, they're listing several kinds of successes. They are listing successes in innovation and in technology and in the development of, uh, of greening the state and stem cells and personal connections, political connections on a small scale. They're coming back at you with success. Andreas Kluth of The Economist, what's wrong with that argument? Well, in particular, Governor Gray Davis was making that point. I wrote down a direct quote from you, Governor. Uh, in California, the private sector is the envy of the world. The public sector is on the mend. You asked me what's wrong with the logic of the first part, and in fact, I'd like to do that, and the second part as well. And examine the first part and go and take a larger uh, uh, period of history, a few hundred years. The most elegant leather shoes come from a town near Bologna in northern Italy. The best violins come from another town in northern Italy. That's been that way for hundreds of years. Would you honestly make the case, would you have made the case for much of post-war history that Italy was not a failed state in the European Union because they had a great shoe industry and a great violin industry in the northern Italy? Gray Davis, to respond. It is irrelevant. The other point, just briefly, you cannot seriously say that the public sector is on the mend at the very moment when they're dismantling entire government programs that were intended to protect the weakest and people are literally going to die, certain old people at home, because home visits are stopping. Andres, let's have uh, Gray Davis respond to your first point. The state... The state is not an abstraction. It is the sum total of the energy, the vibrancy, the creativity, and the innovation of 37 million people. It is an exciting place to live because when we have problems, we don't moan and groan. We don't bemoan our fate. We say, we're going to solve it. We're going to figure it out. We're going to do something different. So for Andreas to dismiss all the energy, the excitement, the creativity that is producing the iPhone and the uh, social networking uh, and alternative energy. We, my God, we've got Exxon Mobil investing $600 million into a San Diego project that will turn algae into oil. I mean, if that's not the establishment saying you're doing something smart in California, I don't know what that's about. Now, to say that's not part of the state is, is, is to say the state is just some civil servants and some black boxes we don't know anything about. The state are human beings getting up every day, doing their best to make the world a better place, expecting to succeed frequently succeeding, but realizing that risk takers, though they are, failure will eventually, well, failure will occasionally occur. Governor, did you say 60 million Wait, or 60 just, billion? I just, just want to that, point that, of that failure will occur occasionally when you take risk, but they don't see failure as the end of the journey. They see it as an occasional stop on the road to success. That's what separates California from a lot of other parts of the world, and that's why it is and will continue to be a successful state despite what is happening in Sacramento. Sharon Wax. Yeah, I had a question. Exxon Mobil, you said it was $60 million in San Diego? $600 million $600 in an million algae dollars. to oil project. Right, okay. So the last quarterly statement for Exxon Mobil, they were, their profits were in the multiple billions of dollars. So in terms of their investments, that's a small multiple for Yeah, but algae like to oil. That. I mean, are, are, we, are we looking into algae and oil in New York? Are we looking to algae and oil in Kansas? Are we looking to algae and oil in Mississippi? They are in Nevada and Andreas Arizona, Clinton. and especially if you want to talk about the green economy, look to Denmark, China, well, Israel. Yeah, it's not in California. Andreas, let's let's bring your, in Van article, Jones, uh, Governor, your article actually, was limited I, to the United States. Gray Davis? Do we, I, 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 do I just I want to make it, one we point. We just have to find one state that's La doing La less, Lawrence, less Lawrence, on oil to algae. Lawrence, if there's one state that's doing less Lawrence, on oil to algae, we win. Lawrence, I just, I just want to make one point. I, I, I am going to refer to Governor Davis as Gray Davis throughout the debate, not out of any disrespect for the office, but because in the debates we keep everything on a first name basis. I want to make that clear. No disrespect is intended. I hope nobody takes it that way. And Lawrence, I was talking all over you, and it was, looked great, so go at it again. Oh. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about budget cutting, and they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to have to cut back on home health care visits and things like that. Um, there are 43 states. 43 states that have cut their enacted budgets of 2009. They enacted budgets for 2009. They, 43 of them went back and cut them, okay? Uh, tomorrow's newspaper will reveal to you that the governor's latest idea, your governor's, New York governor's latest idea, is the largest cut in school aid in more than two decades. That's the latest idea for how to get things going correctly in Albany. Uh, and now, in, in searching for new areas of revenue so they don't have to cut quite so much money, the brilliant idea that your governor here in New York is proposing 
is to legalize ultimate fighting. <laughs> Congratulations. Bobby Shriver. I just, since Lawrence is so funny and so experienced, I just have to do a few little uh, catch-ups here. They don't win if there's another failed state. <laughs> That's not true. It, it's, it's whether this is the first failed state. So he would have to say that New, which he's New York was saying first. right here in New York that New York is the first failed state. Maybe that give him a little bit of a point, but Lawrence, I, I, I think he's I got just you. I don't think that, that's what it is. Let me do a couple of things. Berkeley is a great university. You know what it costs to go to Berkeley a year? Who knows? Thirty plus thousand dollars a year. Is that a public university? It's owned by the public, but when you say find a better one than Berkeley. That's not a public university. The original act that created Berkeley, you went to Berkeley free. Free is public. Free is the community. $30,000 of after-tax money per year is not free. That's not free. Bobby, that, that's, Bobby that's, that's, can I make one other? One that other? isn't right. You, Let, you let's look right there. The, okay. the, under, the fees have gone up. As governor, I opposed every fee. But the fee to be an undergraduate in Berkeley this year is $10,000. Okay, well, then I'm wrong. I read Undergraduate. It's in LA the graduate Times, schools, it will rise. the graduate schools of law and business for several years have been allowed to float up, and they are, as Sharon suggested, uh, $25,000, $30,000. But PhD candidates are very low. So it's still, a, it's higher than it should be, but it's still terrific compared to other alternatives. Well, when you have a student revolt. Can I just finish yes. that off for a second? You do have a student revolt, but I just, I got the number from the LA Times, so, and this is after the new additions, maybe that's wrong. <laughs> Even to me, at 10 grand, it, it's for people who have modest I agree. incomes, I, and I 10 grand of after tax money not 30 is a real grand. thing. Se second thing is, I think if you support, which I do too, a constitutional convention, you're, when have people had constitutional conventions? The National Constitutional Convention was when there was a big old mess at hand. You don't have a constitutional convention when things are going great. Uh, so if you support, right, right? If, I, if you support, Bobby, I want to. I want to. Let me just say, if you support a constitutional convention, and I think you should ask all the three of these gentlemen whether they support it or not, uh, they have to lose because <laughs> you. You don't have Van Jones. a constitutional convention Let's bring in, Van Jones. in a successful or a less than failed state. Van Jones is well, arguing rules against change the by the minute here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, 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 first of all, you're conceding the point, which is that we have in California the tools to continue to solve these problems. Uh, one of the things that's so exciting about the state of California is that people who have ideas get a chance to actually act on them. Uh, maybe to excess at, at this point, we, and I, I would have no problem with rolling back some some of, some of the. Uh, uh, detritus that's accumulated on our Constitution. But we actually have the problem solvers and the tools to solve the problems. And when you say you have a failed state, uh, which, which, you are, which you're suggesting, first of all, you're trying to take off the table the economic successes. The economic successes are a function, especially in the, in the clean tech area, of policy successes, of political successes. We have been able to put aside partisan differences on one question, which is if we are going to have the jobs of tomorrow in California, We've got to have the technology of tomorrow, make the products of tomorrow, and we've been able to get that, that done. And that sets the table for the forward motion you're talking about. So when you try and take off the table, it's, it's striking to me. I've never heard of a failed state where, that is the uh, eighth largest economy in the world. Um, I've never heard of a failed state that is uh, uh, literally one-eighth of the output for the entire country. Uh, California is to the rest of the country what Germany is to the EU. Uh, I don't think anybody's calling Germany a failed state, whatever problems they may, they may, they may be there. So I, I think, again, uh, uh, you're, you're conceding when you talk about the fact that we're talking about a constitutional convention, we're talking about a whole raft, a California Ford and other folks are talking about a whole raft of fixes. We've got the tools and the innovation and determination to fix the problems in California. So That's you're, not saying, a you're saying, Ben, that the, the existence of an ambulance team means that the hospital is basically not shut down quite yet. Well, 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 well uh, if, if, if you want to go with that, if, if you want to go with that analogy, I'm, I'm making the difference. I'm saying that the patient's not dead. And, okay. and, 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 and that's what these guys but, are trying but that's, to do. But I think that's a valid, a, 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 actually quite coaching argument. Andreas, can you take that on? Sure. So if you, if you say, if you want to change it to California is dead, then I have to tell you we're not debating that. We're not arguing it. What we're, by the way, uh, I agree that failure, as you said, is an occasional stop. I happen to be writing a book at the moment about how failure and success are imposters. 
But you have to be honest that a failure has occurred in order to fix it. Californians are honest about it. That's why they will pass the two initiatives that will call for a constitutional convention, just as Americans after the Revolutionary War called a constitutional convention because the Articles of Confederation were a failure. And they accepted that and admitted that first, and then you start fresh. So you need to admit honestly that a failure has occurred, then you move on. Move on. A few, just a little bit of mopping up about the public universities. What is the still remaining excellence of the university system a sign of? It's a sign of the Pat Brown legacy when California was not a failed state. What are they dismantling? I wrote a story about this. I asked professors and the uh, president of the UC system, a, presser, a professor at UC Santa Cruz of astrophysics told me, the excellence is being lost in her department as we speak because of the budget cuts, the people she was hiring to be good professors have defected because they know there's no way for them to, to go in their careers. They're going to more competitive private or other public universities in the, in the state and world. So don't get confused about this public university. It was a sign of something working well 30 years ago. And you, you will see when it's gone that something failed today. And we will patiently await your naming of the state that <laughs> spends more on its university system. On a per capita basis? Spends more on its university system. Uh, well, right. I mean, exactly. <laughs> kind of miss, like miss that. I want to go to the audience for questions now. And again, uh, raise your hand. I'll find you. Uh, microphone in your mouth. Um, there's a, a, a woman, I think, in a gray sweater, right? Uh, yes, that's right. And ma'am, um, it's easier for us, so for the camera, to see if you stand up and uh, hold that mic close and uh, make a good question. <laughs> Sorry? Um, no one here has raised um, the issue of what was passed in 1979, and that was a, a proposition where basically um, negated the state from raising any tax revenues to feed everything that you're talking about, whether it's schools, public universities, services, art, what have you. And I would ask uh, Van Jones, let's start with you. Great that we have clean tech and we have the private industry and we have capitalism and competition. But if you don't have the public monies to support initiatives, where do you get it? You tax the capitalists? Question mark, very good. Van Jones. Well. Uh, it, it, the, the problem in California isn't primarily a revenue problem. I mean, there, uh, we, we had a, a courageous governor, frankly, who uh, was willing to do what needed to be done with regard to, to the so-called car tax, and uh, uh, put the $5 billion was on the table. That's off the table. We're the only, state in Cal only oil producing state in the country that doesn't tax the oil when it comes out of the ground. There's a, bi a billion dollars there. there. There are revenue sources that are available. The problem in California right now is, which, which is why we're here, uh, is that we haven't agreed on the vision for California going forward. Um, now, a crisis of vision uh, is an opportunity. Uh, and, that is, and that's really, I think, what you're seeing in California. People now, uh, in, in a critical mass of people trying to figure out how we, how we go forward. I think, obviously, Prop 13, from my point of view, um, has been a disaster for the state of California. Uh, I, I think, I think it, it's not all taxes, but it is property taxes. And what it, it's done is it's put the state on this yo-yo of uh, tax income from based on income tax and other, and other, other sources of, of, of revenue, uh, we, we would have done better, I think, if we had a, a little bit more opportunity to have a property tax regime in place. And also, the other problem with Prop Proposition 13, which, which was raised, is that it requ requires two-thirds of the legislature to agree to any, any tax increase. And in California, that's a very, very difficult thing to do, given where the Republican Party is. Uh, but, from, but, but what I would say is simply this. Uh, we have an abundance of opportunity in the state of California because of the success of not just our clean, we brag on our clean tech sector because we're so proud of it, but we have nine different regional economies, um, which gives us the ability to do uh, what countries do, frankly. Uh, we have an agricultural region, we have manufacturing, et cetera, and I think that where, where we are at this stage in, in the development of California's uh, economy is we will fix the tax structure, we will fix the budgeting structure, we've already got redistricting done, and then anybody who bets against California right now is going to lose an awful lot of money. Another question? Oh, would you like to respond on this side before I go to a question? I'd like, I'd, like oh, to Sharon oh, yeah, I'd like to not respond, I'd like to ask, 
I've, uh, clean tech is, we keep hearing clean tech, clean tech. How about the industry that I brought up, the Hollywood? Where that, that is just the subject of the most uh, egregious neglect in the years that I've been covering the industry. This is a huge amount of money that the state has just allowed to leave. And only this past year has there been the tiniest, too little, too late measure to keep it to, by, by passing a, a small fraction of the kinds of measures that other states have already had in place for years to incentivize productions to stay in the state. That's money, that's not money that's out there to be created as clean tech is a future and building uh, uh, an economy of where we're going. It's an industry that's there that the state has allowed to slip through its fingers and has never actually uh, created a sense of, as I keep using that word, connection between the people. How, I mean, California invented the motion picture industry. It, cre it invented the entertainment industry. How is it possible that it has been allowed to slip away? Well, that's a very simple question. Lawrence, what Sharon's talking about is what in California is referred to as runaway production. Uh, a show like The West Wing, for example, was shot on a sound stage at Warner Brothers and we would go to Washington a couple of times a year and pick up some exteriors. Dick Wolf, who shoots Law and Order, the most successful show on television in terms of longevity and ratings, wanted higher production values than that. He wanted his cameras to be able to go on the streets of New York every day. And where would you suggest shooting The Sopranos? Do you think maybe we should do that on a back lot at Universal? you think we can just get the palm trees out of the way and give you the right feel by moving The Sopranos out there? What's happened is the artists involved in this giant industry, which is thriving, which has had its biggest box office year of all time this year, in a recession. The artists are looking for higher production values and opportunities to shoot in places that were never available before. You couldn't shoot in Prague 25 years ago if you wanted to. You Lawrence, can now. Did, so you're basically saying that the, 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 the migration of the industry has nothing to do with the management of the state. That's it has absolutely nothing to do with the management that's of the absolutely state. absolutely false. Nothing. And you know it. The taxes, <laughs> that's completely empirically false. Van, Canada, London, 20% tax credits. It's not the artists who make the decisions, as you know. Dick Wolf is an exception. He's not the artist in that case. He's the executive producer. But it's the producers and it's the people who sign the checks who decide where these jobs go. All right. All Sharon, right. I, what I'm, you're I'm, declaring, I'm declaring impasse on the Hollywood What you're question, advocating is a tax I, I'd, I'd like to go to another producers question. in California. To, um, I haven't come to this side. This gentleman in a blue shirt, sir. You can, yeah, stand up, thanks. Thank you. Uh, for, first of all, I, I think that the uh, the dwelling on the word first in the first failed state is, is honestly frivolous. Um, I'd like to, to pose, though, to Governor Davis. I, I was a San Francisco resident for 15 years, and, and I arrived uh, feeling very, very excited about the idea of direct democracy. And it seems like we're avoiding that topic because, in, to my mind, it is the very, uh, the very prevalence of direct democracy that is ruining California and ruining California's political system. Can you, can you formulate this as a, as a question? How do we fix the direct democracy problem in California? Okay, as somebody who I, was I a, think everybody's nodding official. on this one. I'd like to go to Andreas, and Andreas, in, in, in 14 well, wait, seconds, the remind, was, remind... The question was put to me. Was I feel it? like was Reagan it? saying, Mr. Oh. Green, this is my microphone. I'm sorry. I, I apologize, Gray Davis, I had a moderator and, last. And I, I, I can speak with authority on direct democracy because I'm a victim of it as well as... <laughs> as can well you, as Governor, as, can, uh, you, can you take 10 seconds for the people who missed civics class that day? 10 seconds to remind us of what, what direct democracy involves. Direct democracy in California basically means that all issues get to the voters sooner or later. If they don't get to them sooner, the voters put an initiative on the ballot and take matters in their own hands. And basically, everything of consequence gets decided uh, by the voters. And I think they made basically good decisions. I won an awful lot of elections. I lost my last election. But that doesn't mean people didn't have a reason to want to change. What it does mean, however, is they have the power, and I would suggest in our system of special interest, the only people who have the power to improve things in Sacramento. They have already improved them by changing the way legislators, draw, uh, legislators will never, no longer draw the districts. That means they will lose if they're unresponsive going forward. They can improve them further with the passage of the open primary, which I assure you the Republican Party will oppose, the Democratic Party will oppose, 
which ought to tell you how you should vote. Uh, <laughs> and on all major issues like the Constitutional Convention, the vote in November will just be to go out and come back to us with recommendations. If we don't like the recommendations, we will vote them down. But we know the legislature, Republicans won't allow taxes to increase, Democrats won't allow cuts in, in major programs. They are immobilized. They can't solve the problem. The only people who can solve the problem are the voters who will, I predict, with the open primary, have already with re reapportionment, and will, I believe, give voters the opportunity to come back to us with recommendations, hopefully to get away, get a, uh, away with things like a two-thirds requirement to pass a budget. But if they don't come back with good ideas, then the voters will, will, will uh, knock it down. So Andres. direct democracy can be a problem, but it also can be uh, a saving grace. Andreas Kluth. First of all, I have to say I agree exactly with you. You've, because you lived there and because you came from outside, as I did, you saw that direct democracy is a large part of the problem. Part of it is a confusion over the word democracy. James Madison didn't want it even used in the constitution of the country because he was afraid. They had studied ancient Athens, which was a failure because of direct democracy. They had studied Republican Rome, which was very stable. They wanted Rome, not Athens. Fast forward you, to uh, a century ago, the progressive era. Californians and other Western states introduced direct democracy because they were afraid of corruption by the Southern Pacific Railroad of the young state, California. They wanted direct democracies, voter directly passing legislation as a safeguard, as a fourth branch of government to be used sparingly as in Switzerland, which was their model. Fast forward again to Prop 13 and onward, and you have a, a circus, earlier I said, an, you know, an asylum that is run by the inmates. A few, never mind the attack ads, the demagoguery, here is the word count of the longest initiative, 15,633 words. That's, it is, it is, there was a, I remember driving in the car when several propositions were decided last year. An English teacher called in and said she's not able to understand the initiatives on the, battle, uh, on the ballot on grounds of syntax. That's number one. People vote for double negatives when they think they're voting for the triple negative. <laughs> there is, it is in California, this is not a statement against representative democracy as the founding fathers of the nation said. I'm, this is a statement against direct democracy as practiced in California where the legislature is hobbled because it cannot amend initiatives and is unique in that respect. In California, it is the least informed way of making decisions. Other people have said tonight, it is curious how often the tough on crime voters vote for longer uh, prison terms but forget for the taxes to pay for larger prisons vote for faster trains, for smaller school classes, for all these things, and somehow forget not only to vote for the taxes, but then also vote for Prop 13 so that they can't even be raised. Taxes can be raised in California. Oh, Property taxes are the only taxes affected by Proposition 13, and what it tells you is how much they can be raised. What Proposition 13 came along and said, you know what, you're sitting here, you're living in your house, you might be on a fixed income, your house may have gone up in value dramatically over the years while you're sitting in, living on that fixed income, and now we cannot just come in and raise your property taxes 25% next year. They put a limit in how much you could raise them. Proposition 13 allows them to be raised, and the income tax is sitting there ready to be legislated at any time, and the income tax is the fair way to fund government because it is based on your ability to pay. Property taxes are not based on your ability to pay, and California does make a mistake in not raising its income taxes and making them more progressive, raising top-end income taxes significantly because those income taxes are deductible on federal income tax returns, which means at the top rate, 50% of that money is actually being pulled out of what the federal government would have taken for taxation. And you can, through a higher top-end income tax in California, rebalance this relationship to the federal government's take on California's wealth. Taxes can be raised. Okay. They never passed a bill saying taxes Bobby, cannot Bobby be Schreiber raised. To respond. I just want to make one small quibble. Actually, it's a large quibble uh, <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Gray, which is he, he used the phrase, voters put these initiatives on the ballot. The real harsh truth, I'm afraid, is that voters do not put the initiatives on the ballot. There's, an, in fact, a huge industry, which are, in effect, sort of semi-private legislatures. You really have to think about that. There are people who are very well financed, who may not even live in California, who can hire teams of people, uh, which is a business, a big business, to write legislation for the state. 
They've had every conceivable, you all probably know, ridiculous things that have been put on and defeated. Uh, and some ridiculous things have been passed because people, as Andreas was saying, can't figure out the syntax. I'm a lawyer, and I can't figure out some of them. The book that comes to you when you vote is that big, and you're expected to read in very fine print those documents. Uh, and the correlative to this idea is the deprofessionalization, honestly, of the legislature itself, which is to some extent the function of the term, term limits law, which is going to be extended. Passed by initiative. Uh, indeed. But, 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 but the, the point there is that you have these permanent, semi-private, or, or entirely private groups of people whose business it is every year to make law for the state. So who, are you, would you who, make, are you yeah, making the argument? No, and I'm going to say a second thing now that I hear Van's uh, dulcet tones. <laughs> 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 Switching gears a little bit to I'm, think. I'm just it, shocked it, to hear I just California. want to say that what is the state? Where, and I thank you for saying that the first point is a frivolous point, which I entirely agree with. What is the state if it's not the creator of the vision of the state? When Van says we're having a crisis, sure. I, to me, I, I was ready to get up and walk because we win. No, no, no. If there's a crisis, there Failure, requires a you constitutional can't, can't resolve the crisis. A vision. We have not yet agreed what the state of California is. That's, a, that's the ultimate political failure. Because, and that's why a constitutional convention probably will pass. And that's why, I mean, here's the thing that I always loved was the, in the Declaration of Independence, not a constitutional convention, but an important document nonetheless, everybody knows the first sentence, right? All men are created equal. Very few people remember the last sentence, which is, to these truths, we mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our, our sacred, sacred honor. honor. That's the last sentence. Yeah. And I defy you today to get, and the people who signed it, George Washington, richest guy in the country, Thomas Jefferson. Let's, let's bring him back. I, I'm just saying, I'm going to finish. He must Can be going you somewhere. get the I'm citizens of California to Bobby, sign let's hear a from pledge bring in the other side. today? The uh, lives uh, and fortunes. Lawrence maybe would sign Davis. it. Great David. Good friend, Bobby, who I <laughs> appointed to the Parks Commission before his relative uh, kicked <laughs> yeah, him off the Parks Commission. fired me. Thank God he also fired Clint Eastwood on the same day. The entire... Group in favor of this <laughs> proposition. Davis did in fact appoint me. The entire group on my right in favor of this proposition all lives in Bobby Shriver's Councilmatic <laughs> District. So, <laughs> they report Laura Lawrence, but he won't move across. A little cabal over there. Um, I want to make two points. The the Constitutional Convention is proposed by the Bay Area Business Council. Yes. Apple, Google, Hewlett Packard, Facebook, because they think. Sacramento is not acting properly. And to get the constitutional um, convention on the ballot, they have to get the signature of several hundred thousand Californians. So people do put initiatives on the ballot. Now, is it a perfect system? No. And do we have a lot of shysters out there uh, misrepresenting what's on the ballot? Absolutely. My, one of my uh, uh, a sister of a dear friend of mine signed the recall petition against me. And I said, how could that be? And she, she said, because here tonight? Signature, signature gathered said, oh, this is good for, good for teenagers. This is good for teenagers. So, you know, there are flaws in the system. But people do put the initiatives on the ballot. People will solve the problem through the open primary and the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and I have a great faith that Van will wisely use the remainder of our time. Well, I, was, I, I just wanted to point out the, this, 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 is, this is classic California. Here you have the, the people who are saying, the ballot initiative is terrible. It's awful. We've got to get rid of it. So we're going to use the ballot initiative to get the constitutional commission that we want. That's, the, that's the, exactly the beauty of the system that we have, is that we, in California, we have big problems, but we also have big tools to solve those problems. And uh, I would, I, I, I'm shocked are, are you really hear, defending the, sure. the yes. legislative system, I, well, first the, of all, first the initiative all, system? I'm, really? sh I'm shocked to hear a California politician uh, arguing publicly that the people of California should give up uh, the, their ability to participate in California's governance, which is basically what you're saying. Uh, uh, not we, exactly, we, but we, go ahead. Not exactly. I would be happy, and I think most of us here would be happy to see uh, uh, some curtailment of some of the abuses of the initiative process, but I think in California we should be proud. You say that people are ill-informed, et cetera. Well, that's true about you know people going to, into the malls and, and, and making purchases. There's no such thing as perfect information, but in California, every time we have a, you know, one of these moments, people know their voice will matter. They will get a chance to vote directly on some, on some of these issues, and we could not solve the problems that you're describing without the best thinking of all the people let, of California. Let me go to another. I, let me go to another. Impasse, Bobby, I just let me go. have to say one little thing. It's got to be really, really I, little. Really, I didn't say the people were ill-informed. 
Uh, I said I am ill-informed. I can't read. I went to Yale Law case. School with you. I can't case. read <laughs> the thing that comes in my post office box. I'm ill-informed. I so, want to stipulate that this side of the panel agrees with Bobby's <laughs> last statement. <laughs> we, we rehearsed that. We rehearsed that. I want to go to another question. Also, I want to point out that, that Lawrence O'Donnell's tactic of, of playing with the word first has been tried here before. We had a debate on whether George W. Bush was the worst president of the last 50 years here in New York City. Carl Rove spent the whole night talking about Jimmy Carter, <laughs> and he won the debate. <laughs> so whether it works tonight is up to you. One, one more question. Uh, just down this gentleman. Yeah, blue laser. Uh, I'd just like to ask both uh, of you whether you think California will go bankrupt. And if it does go bankrupt, does that mean it's a failed state? <clears throat> Great question. I, I'll answer that. Great, Davis. I can say with uh, no fear of contradiction that it won't because it can't. It can't legally go bankrupt. But more importantly, <laughs> that's technically true. <laughs> more importantly, uh, it'll work its way out of the out of these problems. And if you're thinking of buying a California bond, I can assure you that the legislators understand the importance of lending to get them through these tough times. Bonds come not after schools. The first dollar goes to schools that comes in the door. The second dollar goes to pay GO bonds. The third dollar is to school, the fourth dollar. So as long as we have about 60 cents on the dollar in Sacramento, we probably have about 85 to 95 percent uh, cents now. Your bonds are in good hands. Buy California bonds. Andreas Kluth. Vote no on the proposition. He just made a, a I hope he's covered for his investment advice. Andreas he just Kluth. heard a great answer. If you were wondering whether you should buy municipal bonds in California, that you might. Remember, because it's true, technically, legally, a state cannot go bankrupt. Uh, and the, the order of payments is indeed correct. Remember that the California has the worst credit rating of the 50 states. That is a superlative. It has just been lowered to one notch above junk. By the time this debate is over, it probably is junk. So <laughs> even in the order of payments that you've just heard, which was correct, it may indeed go, uh, you know, the bonds may indeed default, which we don't even need uh, to prove to, to carry our, our motion. Well, Dan, I just, I want to, Dan, do we have time for one more? Okay, well, I'd like to get to one more question with your indulgence to be, just to hear from, from, the, from the people. Um, uh, anybody high, I, arbitrary left side, right side, right here, sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get the panel to focus on the task at hand, and I think the task at hand is ours. We are being asked to cast a one-word answer, a vote, to a six-word question. And the six-word question is, California is the first failed state. And I'd like to focus the panel on the word is. Are we being asked? to decide whether California at 8 p.m. on January 19th, 2010 is failed now, or are we being asked to cast a vote on whether you think the proposition is that California is now and will be irredeemably or for some time to come a Sir, failure? Sir, can, can I just ask you to do something? Because this will be broadcast at different times in different places. And rather than say at 8 p.m., would you mind just restating the, in a very short way? And I might suggest you could say right now at this moment as we stand here. You're in show business like now. You're in show business. I'm going to do another take. show business. Everybody's a director. Um, right now as we stand here. Do, do, should I just say that or do you want me to repeat that? <laughs> you know what? I give up. Let's go to the question. What side would like to take this first? Lawrence uh, O'Donnell. I, I just want to check up here where, where it was determined that, the, that concentrating on the, on the word first is frivolous. What did you make of that one? <laughs> it depends on what the meaning of is is. No, I think I, not at all. I'm, Sharon you know, Waxman. We're, we're clearly saying uh, from a position of people who live in California, who believe in California, who've who, are, who have decided to spend our lives there, that Calif California is currently a failed state. It makes me very sad to hear the other side of the panel giving, paying truly lip service to the notion that, yeah, it has some problems. Talk, that's about the understatement of, that, of this century, this early part of the century or of the new decade. If you live in California and you read the news every day, it is a litany of failures, roadblocks, gridlocks, 
budget, uh, pick your billion, 20 billion this week, 30 billion last, three, six months ago, whatever the hole is it has to be filled, the latest service to be cut, the latest milk and cookies that will not be served. It is, this is the lives of the people of the state of California. It's not a joke. It's not how bad is New York or how bad is Arkansas. It is, this is where we are spending our lives. And for us to be arguing this, it is because we believe that California does hold the promise of being the greatest state in the nation, not because we believe it is irredeemably failed and cannot be saved, but to hear people who are in our government on the other side of, of the panel is suggesting that it's all uh, cheer, cheery and roses is very disheartening, I have to say, for me as a resident uh, of the state. The state is stuck and it is not working. And if you live there and if you pay attention at all, you have to know that. I like to respond to that. Ray Davis. I have a lot of respect for Sharon. You do? But I want to. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I'm, married, I'm married to one out there okay. with me, Sharon uh, uh, Davis. But Sharon Waxman. But you, you are the reason. I have a lot of respect for Sharon Davis. And a lot of love for Sharon Davis. Yeah, do we all? Um, but you'll still vote but for our side. Point. I think you conceded in your first sentence. We live in California. We believe in California. We know it will solve its problems and get better. From 1998 to 2008, according to the Wall Street Journal uh, two days ago, California's economic growth was 25%. The rest, the national average, was 16%. That's real after inflation adjustments. Everywhere you look, people are doing their best to make this world a better place in California, and they're doing it in other states as well. We are doing the best we can in a very difficult time. I'm sure Sharon has noticed that there's a national recession. We have 10% unemployment. There are problems all over America. We are bigger than other states, and the problems sometimes are bigger in California. But they're not too big for us to solve. And along the way, we are contributing enormous productivity and innovation to America. And I suggest to you, as we get more global, we're going to rely more and more on states that can innovate, because you can't outsource an idea until someone invents it. And that concludes round two of our debate. And here's where we are. We are now about to go into round three where we will hear brief statements, closing statements from each of the debaters in turn. There'll be two minutes each. And this is their last chance to change your minds before you vote again. From the live audience vote beforehand, we know where you stood before the debate began. And here again are the results, the results before the debate on the motion. California is the first failed state. 31% of you agreed with the motion. You were for it. 25% were against it. And 44% were undecided. You'll be asked to vote again in a short uh, few minutes from now. But on to round three, closing statements from each of the debaters in turn and speaking first against the motion, Lawrence O'Donnell, senior political analyst for MSNBC and former Democratic Chief of Staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance. Uh, first failed state. Uh, oh, Lawrence, you can, we will sit on all of these. Okay, sorry. Sure, no uh, problem. I thought, I'm sorry, I'm from the state where words matter. <laughs> Same to you. Um, so some people have doubts about what is is mean? That's a familiar question. Uh, some people have doubts that first should be in here, which is to say uh, it's allowable then if we drop first that there are other states doing things much worse than the California government is doing things. Uh, in the fiscal years that cover this current recession, the uh, 2009 through the 2010 fiscal years, states have faced $256 billion in budget gaps nationwide, $256 billion. They've solved $73.1 billion of those budget gaps so far. They have a lot of work to do to close those gaps. This is one of those states where we sit right now. Now, California, in its riches, just like New York, in its riches, has been generous. It has a Medicaid formula that is more generous than other states. If you're on Medicaid in California, you get more benefits at a higher level of income. The, high, the income cutoff is a higher level than in these other states. And so if you want to say to Alabama, go ahead, Alabama, keep it up. Keep it up. Don't let people have Medicaid if they, if they make as much as $15,000 a year for a family of four. Don't let them have it. If you want to vote that way, 
and say, I'm going to penalize the state that has tried, and in its trying has the struggle then in this anti-tax environment in this country of raising the money to pay for what it has promised, and then ends up in this very difficult fight every year about how do we balance this budget that doesn't seem to be balanceable, which is exactly what happens in this state every year, exactly what happens. If you want to penalize those governments, those liberal governments over generations of liberal advance in social programs for overfunding health care for the poor, if you want to call it that, because now it has to be cut back, or overfunding public education because now it has to be cut back under these burdens that they face today, then go ahead, penalize those states. Declare here tonight that Alabama has done a better job than California. Lawrence O'Donnell, your time is up. Thank you very much. Our motion, California is the first failed state, summarizing his position in favor of this motion, the Economist's West Coast correspondent, Andreas Kluth. I don't want to summarize it because I don't think I need to. I want to say thank you to you, sir, for focusing our, our attention again on the proposition that you're now deciding in this binary way. California is the first failed state. You wanted me to focus on is and first. California is the first fa fail state means simply that tonight as we speak it is a failure. It does not mean that five years from now it cannot have made a fresh start. In fact, the most important prerequisite for making a fresh start and ensuring, just as it came up earlier, Pat, in Pat Brown's day, California was not a failure. Today it is. Things can change. However, you have to take a fir uh, vital step first. You have to admit that something has failed for you to change it. This is a sort of a microcosm of two uh, uh, organizations in California, one called California Forward, one called Repair California. The names will tell you nothing what they stand for. One wants to deny that the failure is fundamental and wants to fiddle, wants to fiddle here, fiddle there, muddle along and hope that it'll get better. The other is Repair California, which is the organization now pushing the initiatives for the Constitutional Convention. They want you to say, uh, that the failure is fundamental and therefore we need a new constitution because ours is unmanageably complex with 500 amendments in half the time that it took America's constitution to have 27 amendments, all because of initiatives. The people of California will pass those initiatives calling for a constitutional convention in any poll, opinion poll, that you, you may now read. And that is because the people of California take it for granted. They just assume there is a consensus that the failure is, as of today, in fact, there, that California has failed, and that we must start fresh with a new constitution to prevent it. Finally, first simply means the other states, the other 49, have to watch out so they don't repeat our mistakes. Thank you, Andreas Kluth. Making his summarizing statement against the motion that California is the first failed state, Van Jones, former White House Special Advisor for Green Jobs and co-founder of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Green for All. Well, first of all, I just want to say I do think that the, the question is properly uh, stated about the present moment. Um, I, I want to say that uh, it's been posed that if you don't believe that we are sub a collapse, that we don't care about the people who are suffering in California. That's not true. Um, people are suffering in California right now. Uh, the people are suffering in prisons, uh, way too many people. We're spending way too much money. They have way too little hope and way too little help when they get out. Um, but I also know that we've got great ideas. We have people throughout the state of California moving restorative justice ideas to fix that. Uh, even the governor now says maybe we should make it unconstitutional to spend so much money on prisons, more than we spend on our, on our four-year colleges and universities. When you are looking at how you evaluate any situation in your own life, you look at your problems, you look at your deficits, but you also look at your assets. And as long as you are breathing, as long as you have the ability to confront your problems, you're not a failure. And I'm going to say to anybody in this room going through anything, you're not a failure until you quit. People in California have not quit. We are moving forward. We are coming together in ways that are extraordinary, and we will solve these problems. And I ask you to vote to support us, to encourage us and say that we're not failures, you're not failures, this country is not a failure. We have problems that we, that we have to solve, and we will solve them together. Thank you, Van Jones. 
Making her summarizing statement for our motion, California is the first failed state. Sharon Waxman, editor-in-chief and founder of TheRap.com, an entertainment and media business news source. Well, I believe the other side has actually made our point this evening. They've said that California is filled with innovative people, it's full of ideas, its culture is rich, that invention is still vibrant in the state and the lifestyle is beautiful. All of that is true and that's why we all choose to live there. But all of that is despite the fact that the state has failed. And it's not because, and we stay there for all those reasons because we continue to push forward, but not because the state lends a hand, plays its role in providing education, transportation, security, a prison system, a medical system, the things that are the state. Uh, that is what we're here to talk about tonight. It is a very serious matter for those of us who live and who have engaged our lives in the state. And to hear uh, Van say that we are coming together in ways that are extraordinary, um, it sounds really lovely. I have no idea what that means. Um, we're, we're not coming together, and there's nothing extraordinary about what's happening to California as a state except extraordinarily bad, I'm sad to say. So I ask you all to vote for this proposition as a gesture of not only that we have proved the case, but as a gesture of uh, helping take the step of consciousness and of moving California toward the right future, which is not the path that it's on. Thank you, Sharon Waxman. The motion is, California is the first failed state, and summarizing his position against the motion, Gray Davis, the 37th governor of California, also served as lieutenant governor, state controller, and state assemblyman. I want you to vote against the proposition because the proposition is what it purports to be. California supposedly is the first failed state. By any measure, we are more generous than virtually any other state. I was proud to provide health care to 900,000 uh, youngsters that didn't have it when I became governor. Occasionally there's talk that maybe we have to reduce that by a little bit. I don't like it, but we're living in tough times. As, as, as um, Mr. O'Donnell said, we're more generous in our uh, CalWORKs programs. We have our own separate welfare program to tag on to what uh, uh, the federal government does. We're more generous on our health care programs. We supplement what the federal government does. So sometimes in tough times, we're not able to do all the things we would like to do. But we're not sitting around mo moaning and groaning. We're solving our problems. The people are taking matters into their own hands. I'm confident that they will adopt an open primary. I'm confident that they will give uh, voters the chance to go out and make recommendations to change what's happening to, because of the shortcomings of 121 people in Sacramento. But I just want to assure you that you're going to be in very good company if you vote no. Time magazine would have you vote no. The Wall Street Journal two days ago said, California failed state. It's such a big subsidizer of the, of the other states that are in trouble in this country. It ought to succeed, secede. Now, I don't want us to secede because I don't think we're in great shape today. But we're on our way to be in great shape again. And we're going to be a very important part of America going forward in our global economy. So I would ask you to look at the proposition and say to yourself, California is doing a lot of things better than most other states. I'm not going to say it is the first failed state in America. Please vote no, which I think is number two on your, on your list. Very good. Great, Davis. Thank you. Our final speaker, summarizing for the motion, on California is the first failed state, Bobby Shriver, Santa, Con Santa Monica City Councilman and co-founder of One.org and Red. Thank you. I, I also appreciated the is question uh, because, and I, I appreciate also Sharon's uh, uh, seriousness about this matter. I mean, we've had a little fun, <laughs> which is great. Uh, but the truth is tonight, at this moment, uh, people are suffering in really unimaginable ways. And this is a pretty wealthy crowd, or powerful crowd. We're here in New York. It's all good. The people that the government and the sense of political compassion has created to serve are really, really bad in California. CalWORKs that uh, Gray mentioned is about to be defunded entirely. Uh, the reason that we have a lot of homeless people in LA is not because LA is big, as Lawrence suggested. It's because the policies of the state don't work. 
mental health financing is with the county, housing is with the city. They don't work together. They haven't worked. There's been no progress made. Enormous progress has actually been made in New York on homelessness, uh, despite what other things New York hasn't done well. I want to reiterate, we're the optimistic people. We're not moaning and groaning. We're not, uh, oh, woe is us. California doesn't have a lot of brilliant people, a lot of venture capital, uh, a lot of cool companies. We acknowledge all that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the state, which is a revenue collection mechanism. It disperses money to people to do things that the community wants done. If that isn't happening, the state, not the people, not our energy, not our optimism, not our tools, none of that is relevant. It's a revenue collection thing based on principles. We are not collecting and distributing the revenue to the most vulnerable people in the state today by an immense margin. The suffering there is immense. And that's why you have to vote to give a wake-up call to the people who hold the power in the state and the people of the California so that they could feel comfortable to say, you know what, we're optimistic, we're going to get it done, but we, we got a problem. Thank you, Bobby Shriver. And that concludes <laughs> round three of our debate. And now it's time to find out who our winners are. You in the audience will choose our winners. I'm going to ask you to go again to the keypad on the right arm of your seat. At each seat, you will register your vote, and we will get the readout instantaneously, practically. Vote number one, if you are for, our motion is California is the first failed state. Vote number one, push number one, if you are for the motion. Push number two, if you are against the motion. And number three, if you remain undecided. <laughs> because they're New Yorkers. New Yorkers, they get to vote. I, you know, I, 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 uh, I just want to thank this panel for the level of uh, game they brought to this debate tonight. They really put the intelligence in intelligence square. It's really excellent. And also, you in the audience, the questions were excellent tonight. But before I announce the results of the vote, which I'll have in just a minute, uh, a few things to take care of. Our next debate will be on Tuesday, February 9th. Our motion is, the U.S. should step back from its special relationship with Israel. Panelists for the motion are New York Times columnist Roger Cohen and Columbia University Professor Rashid Khalidi. Against the motion are Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, who served uh, under both Presidents Carter and Clinton, and Israel's former ambassador to the U.S., Itamar Rabinovich. Individual tickets uh, are still available for that one uh, by visiting our website and also at the Skirball box office outside. And you can follow, join, become a fan of Intelligence Squared on Facebook, uh, and by doing so, receive a discount on our upcoming debates. All of our debates, as you know, because we've talked about it tonight, can be heard on NPR stations now on more than 200 stations across the nation. I guess they're going to have to edit around that dating thing that you did, but they, they can work. You can also watch uh, the spring debates on Bloomberg's television, on the Bloomberg Television Network, air dates and times can be found in your program. And also, don't forget to read about tonight's debate in next week's edition of Newsweek. And there's, uh, there are copies in the lobby that you can pick up on your way out. So. Now the results are in. Uh, they've just been handed to, to me. And remember, the team that changes the most minds is the team that de is declared the winner. Now, our motion is California is the first failed state. When you voted before the debate, 31 percent of you were for the motion, 25 percent against, and 44 percent undecided. After the debate, 58 percent are for the motion, 37 percent against, and 5 percent undecided. The team for the motion wins our debate. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, to you and our audience. From me, John Donvan, thank you from Intelligence Squared U.S.